Hi everyone, this is Nigel Merrick, founder of the Xenolog Photography Business and Marketing website and a very warm welcome to our latest Pick Our Brains Featured Photographer webinar. Today I'm really excited to be here with Becky Reams. She's originally from southern Kansas and now runs a very successful food photography business in LA where she infuses her work with inspiration from a wide variety of different sources. Now, as well as photographing food, Becky is also an expert at creating it, and many of you may know her as, oops, excuse me, I just dropped my pen. Uh, many of you may know her as one of the top three chefs from season three of Fox's MasterChef. And today we'll be talking about creativity in food photography, how to create better compositions and make images that stand out from some of the more traditional commercial food or lifestyle photography. Becky is also an expert in how to retouch food images and at being mindful of not doing too much to the photographs. Instead, she focuses on creating a perfectly imperfect image, which is becoming the new style in today's food photography world. As always, as we go through this, we'll take your questions along the way. So if there's anything you want to ask, just type those into the questions box and we'll do our best to answer those for you. So welcome, Becky. It's fantastic to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. Oh, me too, likewise. And, uh, you know, um, this is just uh, a fantastic opportunity. I'm really, uh, really grateful for you doing this uh, with us. And you know, before we get started and before we sort of dive into uh, some more stuff about your photo business, uh, can you give us a quick idea of, you know, how you got started in the food photography business and how you got onto your, all your wonderful adventures in that? <laughs> it's definitely, yeah, adventures I think is the perfect word and I think that my path has been uh, very convoluted and you never really know where you're going to end up, but I, like you mentioned, I'm I'm from Kansas, so I I grew up in Stillwell, which is just south of Kansas City, and then um, when I was a little bit older, I moved more into the city, but uh, living in Kansas was great. It's a very, you know, kind of one-note place. A lot of people stay there their whole lives and whatnot, but when I was in high school, I kind of didn't know where I wanted to go after I graduated, and you get all this pressure about trying to decide what college and da-da-da-da, but for whatever reason, I really, really loved photography. I took my first photo class when I was like a junior in high school, and um, I, I was pretty good at it. For whatever reason, those things just kind of clicked to me, like the the idea of like taking a photograph and, and kind of capturing a moment. And then I loved the dark room, so I was always in the dark room every night uh, after school and whatnot. So I had entered some competitions from one of my um, instructors that was kind of pressing me. And, and I did pretty well, and I had a, a bunch of photographs that went to New York, and I won some awards and whatnot. So I was kind of like, I should do. So I started looking into art schools and um, just being kind of picky. I knew that I wanted to get out of Kansas, but I didn't really know where I wanted to go. So I ended up choosing Brooks, and Brooks Institute is a private photography school in Santa Barbara. And um, having never been out of Kansas, mind you, I'm like 18, 19 years old at the time, I just kind of decided that's what I wanted to do. And I moved to Santa Barbara um, and went to school there. And it's like a three-year program. It's year-round classes. And I tested out of my first uh, probably like six or seven months because I'd been shooting on a 4 by 5 camera and processing all my own film and photos. So I ended up going there. I was there for a couple of years and graduated and then moved to Los Angeles to start working. And that's, that's kind of it. I mean, <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, it's been crazy. Yeah. And, and so you, you didn't... Um you know, you didn't start with digital stuff. You were right in there with all the film and, and oh, yeah. large format cameras and, and so on. Okay. Uh, and I think that, uh, it, you know, I, I learned that way when I was doing my underwater stuff. I, you know, I shot on film and, uh, you know, you had to be very careful about what you were doing and picking the right, uh, the right shot and that kind of thing. So for you, did... did um, being a photographer come first, or did you know? And, and certainly, your sort of attraction to food photography did that come first, or were you uh, interested in cooking food first? Um, it's kind of a chicken and the egg story for sure. Um, I've been cooking for longer than I can remember, really, and that's always just been you know at home. Like my mom was always a huge cook, so I would always cook with her, and just kind of being around food. And I always say that. It's more more than cooking. It's more about the action of actually feeding people and that whole 
kind of mentality that comes with dining together or, or the act of feeding someone and nourishing their heart and their soul and their body. And so I loved that. I've been cooking for a long time. When I moved to Santa Barbara, it kind of morphed into me actually being extremely interested in the act of cooking because all of a sudden I had to cook for myself. My mom wasn't around. And I discovered Food Network, which when I was growing up, we never had cable. So the idea to me that there was an entire channel devoted only to food <laughs> was kind of a revelation. <laughs> so I just, I dove straight in. You know, you're out here. There's all this amazing seafood and produce, and you're right in the heart of just some of the best produce, best fruits and vegetables on the planet. So I started cooking, and then when I was in school, I was actually thinking I was going to be a fashion photographer. And I thought that I really wanted to shoot people and all these things, and I love people, but it was not until almost graduation, like my last four or five months, that I started shooting food, and it just clicked. It was like the light bulb went off, and it, it made so much sense to me. And compositionally, visually, being able to create these images and kind of shift focus in the actual image to the food and, and making it look beautiful and lighting it and all these things that you get this really close, almost like... Uh, like you're looking through a, a lock or something. Like you get this really up close image of what it is that you're eating, and that was just beautiful to me. So mm -hmm. I started focusing all my efforts on food photography. And at the time, I didn't know anyone that shot food. I think in my graduating class, I was kind of the only person that was shooting food, and it it wasn't as popular, if you will, of a um, I guess path. But it it made sense. So it kind of came together in this perfect in this perfect way. Yeah, I mean. It would you say that uh, until recent years that you know food photography had been sort of the domain of maybe some of the uh, bigger photographers you know with the bigger studios and that kind of thing and it's just it, and it's kind of become uh, sort of percolated down now to the to the smaller sort of one man photographers it's, it's, it seems to be definitely becoming more and more popular uh, for sure I see a lot of people for example in my LinkedIn group uh, that that now photograph food and there's, there's of course there's other whole groups dedicated just to uh, food photography I mean has it become a sort of a an evolving genre if you like oh absolutely and I think that Within the last, what, like five or six years, food photography has blown up and just food, I guess, adventure in general. And what I mean by that is that all of a sudden, since people have iPhones and smartphones, everyone's photographing their food, and it's become this huge trend where it's really awesome to go out to eat and take 15 pictures of whatever it is that you're eating and then talk about it. And everybody wants to try all these new restaurants, and it's this huge fad, which is great. I love that people have kind of opened up to all this new style of eating, but at the same time, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I feel like the, the cook in me, the part of me that cooks and, and respects the food is, is a little bit hurt by that sometimes because I think it gets a little bit, um, I don't know, like ostracized, but I think that food photography on a professional level from what I do, there's a lot more now than there were 10 years ago, it, from what I can tell, and that's also only because I'm immersed in the industry now, so I notice, I think, more so because I do so much research. I'm such a, I'm just a, I'm a big, <laughs> I sound funny, but I do. I research lots of photographers that I love online and I'm constantly flipping through magazines and cookbooks. And um, for me, having never gone to culinary school, learning about food is very much by my own uh, hand, I guess you can say. So for me, when I'm learning about food, I'm also researching other restaurants and what chefs are doing. And by that means, I'm also looking at other photographs. And right. I think they're noticing it more. And, and there's just so much great work out there. It's it's really inspiring. It is. And uh, I'm just going to change the slide here. I, I think uh, typically what tends to happen when I'm changing slides, the audio goes a bit weird. So I'm just going to be quiet for a second while I just... Switched another. Ooh, oh, look at that! <laughs> and uh, that's my kind of food. Okay, awesome. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it that just looks delicious. <laughs> Let me see if I can find that photograph. I can show you how. That you looks really, yeah, really awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, with with the advent of social media and the 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 internet exploding so much as it has done in in the last decade, you know, it, it it's. Probably no wonder that so many photographers are now coming out of the woodwork, as it were, uh, and collecting together online. So maybe that's one of the things that also makes it seem like there are uh, more uh, more than there were. So yeah. let, let me ask you this. How do you feel that 
being a chef has influenced your approach to photographing the food? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? How the, how what is what? How do, you, how do you feel that being a chef has influenced your approach to photographing food? Oh, well, a lot actually. I mean, mostly, I, I kind of photograph food like I cook food. And what I mean by that is that I'm very, um, it's like equal parts intention and really, really close attention to detail and equal parts kind of spontaneity and just being in the right place at the right time. And what I mean by that is that when you're cooking, there's a lot of skill involved, right? There's all the mechanics. There's being able to make a sauce, like reducing, being able to cut your vegetables and your fruits and knowing when something is medium rare or being able to cook a vegetable to al dente. So there's all those kind of rules, if you will, the things that actually make the food turn out great. Then there's also equal part of the part of the kitchen where you're like, well, I think this needs more salt, so you add a dash of salt to kind of liven it up. Or you think that it's a little bit flat, so you add a squeeze of citrus to brighten it up. And so those are things that kind of happen spontaneously, <coughs> excuse me, that make it better. And when you're shooting, it's very much the same thing. So I know that I need a backlight and a reflector, so I set that up. And then I know that I want to kind of situate the plate off-center to the back of the frame, so I do that. And then I'm shooting, I'm shooting, and then maybe something interesting happens, like the sun goes behind a cloud and I get this kind of soft, you know, diffused light. So maybe I turn off my electronic light and I just use the natural light, and all of a sudden that creates this completely different image that's really wonderful that kind of happened on accident. Or I decide that I want to move, like, a, a, a celery leaf, or I want to kind of cut into the sandwich to make it look a little bit like it's kind of being eaten. And you get this very, all of a sudden you can relate to the image. So whereas like 15 years ago, commercial food photography, if you look for your old cookbooks, was very glossy, very staged. Everything was perfect. There was exactly three leaves of parsley. There was one fork and one knife and et cetera, et cetera. And now you're seeing a lot more kind of rustic photographs where there's crumbs on the plate and it's kind of dark and shadowy and there's this more ominous feeling. And I really love that. And I think that when people think about food photography, they don't think about a personal connection to the photograph because you think, well, I can't relate to this photograph because it's not a, a baby. It's not a dog or something. But when you do look at food photographs, for me, I, I become very engrossed in them and I have a very uh, personal connection. And I think a lot of people can kind of relate to that. And I think that being able for me to cook and then also make the photographs of the food, it's like I'm putting my whole heart into what it is that I'm creating. And I really want people to see that and kind of understand how much love goes into kind of making the food and then being able to photograph that in a way that um, displays that in the best way. Right, right. And uh, I'm just going to switch to uh, to the next one because I'm excited to see what we've got in here. Oh, pomegranates. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, what you just uh, what you just said back there was was very interesting uh, because it reminds me of something that I read recently, and I and I wish that I could remember where I read it. Well, actually, I know where I read it. It was on Copy Blogger. It was one in one of their posts. It was a story that they had put into a post to illustrate something and uh, and I think as well that this is something that uh, you know people like you know Gordon Ramsay and all those people that you were so fortunate to work with on the MasterChef program would certainly love to hammer into everyone's head and that is respect the ingredients yep. when it comes to but to cooking certainly you know is Absolutely. to respect the ingredients and I think that what what you do when when it comes to photographing the food is to respect the ingredients from a photographic standpoint as well. Yeah, I think yeah. that that's a big part of it and especially if you're photographing food for a client for example, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing when you're working with a chef directly and for me I think having a cooking background and being a cook, it's like I have a little bit of an extra edge because I understand from their perspective, like, hey, I don't want you to move this or I don't want you to put all that sauce on there because that's not how I would serve it. And so you have to be mindful of not only creating your photo to make it look good because that's your primary focus, but you kind of have to think about what their intentions are as well. And when I say they, I mean the chef or the, the restaurant, the client, whomever it is, because you want to be able to you know, and add a little bit of olive oil to make it shine or, or, um, or, you know, kind of move some of the pieces to make it aesthetically more interesting. But you also want to be respectful of the dish that they've created. Um, a good example, actually, the first photograph on my website that pops up that cover with the lobster, 
is that was a really difficult shoot. And it wasn't difficult photographically. It was difficult because the original dish was a very, it was delicious, of course, but it was a salad. It was a type of mixed mushroom salad with lots of great vegetables in it, all this stuff in the shell. But it was so busy that when you looked at it, the photograph or through the lens, it just was so busy. It was just too much. You couldn't really focus on anything, and it didn't look good. So we had to completely rebuild it. So I worked with the chef for probably an hour with our tweezers and everything, and we just we put every little ingredient into the shell, and we kind of really pared it down. And I'm also a big fan of less is more. And I think that simplicity is a lot of times more beautiful than showing too much, you know, because if you leave a little bit to be desired and there's a lot more negative space, it's just compositionally more interesting. So that shoot was really difficult because it was a, a blend of me working with him to kind of try to make the photo better without blatantly being like, hey, this doesn't look good. We need to do something else. Because you don't want to ever be mean or be rude. You just have to kind of try to easy, like, ease your way into getting what you need. And mm -hmm. that's, sometimes, that's sometimes one of the biggest struggles, I think, as a photographer. Yeah, because, you know, you're trying to convey something in a photograph that really applies to at least two and possibly in some cases even three different senses. I mean, you, you, there's obviously the, the taste of the food. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we've all come across food that maybe you would look at it and go, well, you know, that doesn't look great, but, you know, it tastes fantastic. Right. And, yeah, I, and, and that's it, what you're doing. You're selling an, you're selling an idea. So yeah. even though this might not be precisely what it is that it looks like in real life, you have to convey that to the viewer. And so mm -hmm. it's, you know, you have to kind of do a little bit less or a little bit more to, to fake it, if you will. Right. But having said that, I also think that it's, I don't use a ton of, like, fake things. You know, you hear a lot of horror stories about food stylists and food photographers using, like, shortening and lots of oil and all these crazy things to make the food look good. I try to do that as as little as possible. I'm definitely a purist in that oh. sense. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably because you want to eat it afterwards, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, Marcia had a good question about this image right here. Uh, she said, uh, did you use the tarnished fork uh, in the photograph on the left there uh, to keep the reflections down deliberately? No, actually. That's a really great point, though. I should have been thinking about that. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, a completely, it was a completely an aesthetic choice. I collect a lot of um, quirky little plates and forks and knives and props, and I, I like that kind of vintage -y dirty feel. Not dirty per se, but just aged, authentic. It's more attractive. But the um, the byproduct of that is that, yeah, it is. It's tarnished, so there's no reflection, mm -hmm. which is good. It actually reminds me, look, looking at it, it reminds me of when I was a child and eating uh, cake on a Sunday afternoon visit to my, to my grandma who lived in Wales. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. You know, because it really does have that that vintage look to it. Okay, let's see what's on the next one. Let's uh, change up the view a little. What have we got? Oh, no, that looks good. <laughs> okay, awesome. So, for people who are getting into the business, you know, for photographers who are, you know, thinking to themselves, you know, what I love food. I would love to uh, do some food photography. You know, what uh, what would you say are the biggest business mistakes that are being made by uh, new photographers trying to get into it? Biggest mistakes? Well, I've made a lot of them, let me tell you. Um, first of all, I think just m reaching out to people too soon. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't happen overnight that you become the type of photographer that you want to be or that you are meant to be. It, you know, it's taken me, I graduated in 08, so many years, like four or five years to really get to a point in my photographic career that I feel like my style is um, accurately depicting of the type of photographer that I am, the type of work that I want to produce for, for magazines or advertising clients or whatnot. And when I was, like, you know, a few years ago, I was shooting some good stuff and I had some clients, but it wasn't a huge client base. You know, I wasn't shooting ads for bird's eye or something like that, you know, it was small editorial. But as I've kept working, like, my work has gotten better and my portfolio has gotten more diverse and I've been able to really, for myself, target the type of photographer that I am. And that's something that they pound into you, not only in school, but in the media, you know, is being able to define a style and define your style. And I think that if you reach out to um, photo editors, buyers, 
too soon and your work is okay, but it's not the caliber of the work that they're currently printing, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to hire you and they're not going to really think about you that much. They're going to kind of look at you as a little bit green and all these things. So if you can kind of wait and just keep working and just try to continue to build your portfolio, and once you feel like you have a solid body of work that you would not be, you wouldn't have to say, oh, well, this isn't my favorite image, but keep scrolling through, like this image is really great. You know, you want all of your images to be able to kind of stand on their own. And you don't want an editor to look through your work and be like, well, that one's good, that one's okay, that one's god awful, because it should be kind of consistent. Mm -hmm. People want to hire photographers that are consistent, that do good work, that are extremely reliable, and that deliver on time. Those are the biggest things. They just want you to make their job easier. So you want to kind of hold back on those those connections until you're really ready. And that's hard because you want to you want to make money. Yeah. You, know, you have to be patient. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, being a good editor and certainly a, being your your own best critic, you know, yeah. it is it's something that actually is, I, I think a lot of photographers find really difficult to do, especially at first. I know I did, you know, and you see the, especially on a lot of blogs and, and so on where the photographer literally just blasts the blog post with um, you know 10, 15, 20 photographs all at one time and when really if they'd have focused the attention on maybe just one or two of the very best ones they would, they would have maybe gotten more of a response from their audience maybe more engagement uh, perhaps people sharing that stuff more but in amongst that, you know, there's always going to be those few images that are just not quite the best ones. And uh, I think, uh, you know, learning to be able to go through a set of images and to ruthlessly just kick out anything that is below the the, the standard that you set for yourself, it's it's a skill that's that's learned and, uh, and and can be quite difficult actually to master. It is, and it's still, it's not something that I've mastered by any means. It's, editing is, is the hardest, perhaps one of the hardest parts of the business, and it's something that you would never think of, like, oh, well, if I have, and it's funny, because if you have 15 great images, and you're like, oh, man, I'm so, I'm so stoked, I have all this great work, like, it was a great shoot, and then you go through, but you don't want to post two pictures that are too similar to one another, even if they're both killer, you really have to be able to kind of just pick a couple. And my my workflow for that is pretty simple. I just go through always on the same day, like after a shoot, as soon as I get back to my office, you know, I upload everything and I pull up all my images and sometimes it's, you know, thousands. And I go through and just immediately I'll look at every single one for probably a second, maybe two seconds, and I'll just star or I'll mark my first edit. I'll go through and I'll do that with all the ones that I think are good. You know, they're in focus, always check focus. So if it's a great photo but it's a little soft, just forget it. Like don't even look twice make my first big edit, and then I'll go through maybe that same day or the next day, and I'll only look at the ones that I had marked first, and then I'll make a second edit, and usually chop those in half. And you just have to do that until you get down to, say, you need like five or six images. And then you just kind of choose the very best ones, and then use those, and then don't look back at your immediate, like your first run, you know, because then you're going to start to second guess yourself and whatever. And your first intuition, your first thought is always right. It, it really is. So you have to trust that you're making the right decisions right off the bat. Now, if that's for if you're editing your own work. A lot of times, <clears throat> if you're sending it to someone, they make the edits, and, and that's a whole other animal because I've had so many shoots where I, I, I love certain images and the clients just don't use them, and they use ones that I think are less dynamic, but you can't, you can't get around that. I had a full page printed in GQ of an image that was kind of out of focus, and I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> but, Whatever, they loved it, and I just, it was so strange. That's what matters, isn't it, at the end of the day? You know, really, if they, if they loved it, then, you know, that's... I'm just like, I don't, this one, this one's bad. I'm like, use this photograph, it's so much stronger. <laughs> because they have all these other things they're looking at, too, especially if it's for editorial. Um, they're looking for copy space. And what I mean by copy space is that, um, I'm sure you know this, but if you have negative space in the image where they can run verbiage, where they can literally put in, like, oh, mm -hmm. this week check out this recipe for hash browns or whatever it is. So they are looking for a lot of different things. Photo right. editors have a whole separate, uh, I guess, um, it is, but, you know, what they're searching for, their agenda, I guess. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, they, they all have their own sort of criteria for the mm -hmm. images that they're looking for. I mean, like this one here, you know, it, there's... Uh, white space or in this case dark space you know whether they could where they can actually put 
text. Uh, I mean, this one, you know, there'd be even perhaps room to put a, you know, a small recipe or a list of ingredients or something on the side or just some description of how to make it and that kind of thing. So I'm just going to switch to the next one because I'm, I'm really, I'm loving these. Ah, more desserts. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ex excellent. So, when it comes to marketing your business um, and you know getting people to to hire you, I mean, obviously you you know you you're pretty well known now as a result of uh, your your sort of adventures on MasterChef, of course. Uh, but you know what, um, what what do you typically find to be the marketing strategies that work best for you? Well, I mean, I think that, first of all, you do have to have good work, first of all. So I think that once you have a solid kind of body of things, that, like I said, you'd be happy that anybody could see. I think for a long time, I thought my portfolio was okay, but I wouldn't want certain people to see it, whatever. So once you're kind of there, you want to start trying to reach out to people. And you can do that either by means of like direct mail, which is a very popular and effective tool. Sorry, I'm just going to drink the water. And email marketing, and then actually like, directly contact people. So there's a great website, Agency Access. It used to be ad based. And that's like basically it's a huge catalog of anyone you could ever want to contact. And it's a paid service. You pay for it and they give you a directory of the contact information for editors, book publishers, buyers, art directors, creative directors, all these people, which is huge. So that's great. That gives you a starting point to kind of start sending out work. And so I send out um, email blasts, like email marketing things, maybe every month, maybe once a month, once every two months. And that kind of at least gets eyes on your work. So you can kind of track too. So you can see who opened the email, who clicked through, how long they were on your site, and those types of things. That's data that is very important to you because then you can say, okay, this person opened the email and they clicked through my blog and they've clicked through it two months ago when I sent it. So that person obviously likes your work. So that's someone that you would want to then call and be like, hey, I, I love, um, we'll say it's Sunset Magazine. You know, I love Sunset Magazine. I'm always, I think the photography is beautiful. Uh, if you would ever be interested, I'd love to set up a meeting. Um, just, you know, bring my book in, show you my book, leave it, just whatever. And that's really all you want to do. You just want to start a dialogue. And you don't want to ever be too overzealous and be, hey, I'd love to shoot for you. Do you have any um, photo shoots this week or next week that I can do? Um, if you're interested, I'll send you my day rate. Like, you, you don't want to kind of jump the gun. You kind of want them to more just be interested. And so having a great printed book in this case is awesome. And I think that that's something, too, that's gone, gone away a little bit in recent years because with the advent of, like you were mentioning earlier, social media, you know, our photos are everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. the photography can be anywhere, Instagram, all these things. So, but a lot of editors, a lot of buyers really, really still love a printed book and you know, they just want to be able to see it in person and it also kind of validates you as a professional because if you've taken the time to make a book, print it all, get it delivered, that, that's a lot on your end so they know that you're serious and it's not just that you have 30 other people that you're also talking to and you're just sending them all like e-portfolios, which isn't always bad. It's good for quick, but you want to kind of try to make a solid relationship. So I would say start there. Um, actually, I wouldn't say start there. I would say move to that point. But a good starting point would maybe be just getting on social media and kind of telling people about what you do, showing pictures every once in a while. A blog, obviously a blog is huge. So I also have like a photo Tumblr, which I just do photos. And that's much simpler. Like my, my blog is more kind of cooking directed. So I do recipes and tips and thoughts and all those types of things, which obviously has my photography as well whereas the photo tumbler is just like a photo that I kind of put up with a little sentence or a blurb or something that I'm thinking. So right. Definitely being connected online is huge. Yeah, you know, building relationships with people uh, rather than just trying to collect names and followers to target for marketing is, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it, it takes a little bit more time and it takes more effort and more work, but it's at the end of the day, that's the one that is going to make the best connection uh, with people uh, for sure and I know you mentioned your, your your blog too which is which is great so obviously that plays a big role in in what you do and um, uh, you know from from the standpoint of somebody that hiring or wanted to hire a food photographer I can imagine that 
looking at somebody like yourself who is quite obviously a very accomplished uh, chef in their own right as well as a good food photographer I mean that must be a tremendous advantage well, thank you. I don't know if I'm a highly accomplished chef at this point. I'm a good cook. Well, from what I saw on TV, you certainly were. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thank you. I mean, I it's an it's a never-ending thing. It's it's a continuing. Uh, I don't want to say battle, but you know, I'm learning all the time. I learn new things about photography every day. New things about myself, and the cooking world is even beyond that. There's so much out there that um, just remarkable. Just some of the most talented people. And, so just trying to be around those people and learn from them is huge. And um, Something else, too, I think that is important is that what you were saying about building relationships, that's really kind of the backbone of the business because there's only so much you can do. You know, we're not accountants and we're not, uh, you know, we don't work for like a firm or something where you have a great resume and then you set up an interview and they hire you. You really have to build people's trust. And I think that the best way to do that is a lot of times by referral as well. So. The majority of my business is through referral business, and so even with like GQ and Cooking Light, I got both of those jobs because I was referred through from another person that had kind of looked at my work. So if you work with one magazine, and a lot of times you're not getting paid to start, you know, I would do a lot of work for local magazines, kind of on trade, and you do like a little bit of trade, and then you get your name printed, and you kind of get the tear sheets because it's a, you know, you have to get tears to get big jobs, but to to get tears, you have to have tears. So um, once you know someone and then they work with you and you do a great job, then they'll want to recommend you to other people. And, and that's it's a slow process, but once it starts working, then you get more jobs. And mm -hmm. You have to kind of trust that, that your hard work really is going towards something. And to just be honest and to be ethical, too, and not, not try to get too much too fast or, you know, step on other people throughout the process. You have to kind of be... Is right. Which yeah. Is hard, but I'm, I have no patience. So. <laughs> cool. And uh, so uh, we'll be moving in a moment to uh, you know, seeing some of your your work, and we'll be talking about some of that. And, and folks out there, if you you can get your questions ready and and ask those uh, when Becky starts to go through her photos. But I have a question here, uh, <laughs> and. F for a second, I thought it was you asking yourself a question because they have the same name. I do talk to myself often, so I mean, there is. <laughs> well, I don't know if they have the same name exactly, but they certainly have the same first initial and the same last name. So anyway, uh, maybe a, re a relative, I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's a great question nonetheless, and it says, if you were to advise future photographers on a set of goals, early goals and future goals, what type of time frame would you tell them to prepare for in order for them to have a good chance to be successful? Uh, in addition, what are your immediate goals and what, and what are your future goals? That is a big question. <laughs> that is like one question with 87 parts. I know. Um, <laughs> and, and I can read the parts out again to you if, yeah, you, if you need me to. I feel like I'm in that movie Back to School. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, no, no, no. That's a great question. I think that time frame, time frame. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that from the time that you kind of start shooting, well, first of all, it's not a big money-making business right off the bat, right? Like, you have to do a lot of other things. So from when I graduated college, I was retouching. I actually started retouching for Guess, the clothing company. I was working in their photo studio for like two and a half years, so which is a, a while. But the great thing about that was that I was still in the industry. You know, I was surrounded by the professionals, and I was still getting the opportunity to kind of learn and do my own work on the weekends or whatnot. So for me, it probably took me two and a half years to, to make that jump where I was like, okay, I'm going to go completely freelance. Like I'm not going to have another job. And because in LA, it's all about hustling. You know, you got to fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. And so, and that's not anything to be ashamed of. I think that it's important to be able to do lots of different things. But I think that a good time frame goal as a photographer is to kind of get yourself established. I would say Within like three years, I think is probably a good time for what it's going to take to maybe get like your own studio or, or um, have your, you know, your solid business where you're doing a lot of work. And but it's it's a very hard thing to put a number on, only because there's so much of the business that's kind of being in the right place at the right time. You know, maybe you, for me personally, like I'll get a food styling job, and then from that food styling job, I actually got a photography job, which is kind of related but kind of not. So it's it's 
it's different for everyone, unfortunately. I think that people like, you know, Ansel Adams, like how would you define his success? You know, when did he become successful? Well, some say it's after he died, but some would say that it was when he was working, when he was shooting at, you know, Half Dome and all those things, because mm -hmm. his photos are so striking, but a lot of people didn't necessarily know who he was at the time. He's just a crazy guy that lived out of his van with a giant camera that people didn't understand. Right. So I think that it, it depends. And then what was the second part of the question? My goals? Yeah. Uh, so what are your immediate goals and, and future goals? What, what, what does the future hold for, for Becky? <laughs> well, my, my future goals, within two years, I want to own my own restaurant. So that's a big thing is that um, I do want to have my own restaurant. I want to be cooking and creating just really um, fine dining food, but in kind of an atmosphere that's approachable for people that in a very small venue, um, which is really awesome products and just trying to kind of make food that is beautiful and utilizes all the fresh, amazing produce and just respecting the ingredients like what we were talking about. So that's a big part of it. Um, but I have a little ways to get there. I, I still want to learn a lot more. I'm, I'm going to go stage over in uh, Spain for four months. And so I'll be there for a while in a kitchen. But in the meantime, as far as photography, uh, I definitely want to get more editorial. So I want to do more work um, in magazines along the West Coast because I'm kind of in this area. And I love travel photography. And I would love to actually be able to do more travel photography and really build up my work from there. And I think that to do that, I obviously need to heed my own advice. And I need to start contacting more people in that industry to kind of spur some excitement and, and get more work. So I would say within a couple of years, probably within like two years, I'd like to try to get a travel story printed in magazines like Afar or Sunset or um, Travel Leisure and Town and Country, a lot of these magazines that are really beautiful and have really great spreads that um, they have a pretty solid base of photographers that they work with regularly. So I want to kind of try to break into their, their vault of photographers that they regularly use and do that. And, and just to I guess a smaller term goal too would be to blog blog more. <laughs> I haven't been <laughs> blogging nearly as often as I'd like. And, and you're so great about it and Nigel and your blog yeah, I mean you you're always posting about just the best things ever. And so I need to I was inspired. I was reading through your stuff. I was like, God, I was like, he's on it, man. Like every couple of days. Like, so well, That's what I have to do. <laughs> I think somebody accidentally spilt super glue on my chair about four years ago, and I haven't been able to get up since, so I may as well do something. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like sometimes, although I actually, I, I really do love what I do. I mean, there's no yeah. question. I mean, I, I, I love to, uh, I love doing this, you know, talking to other photographers like yourself all over the world, and I love doing my coaching uh, business, the online marketing coaching, and I live writing for the blog. So, yeah, I consider myself to be very lucky uh, in that regard. But, you know, of course, you know, you could always uh, set yourself up as a, a, a travel photographer that also photographs food in, you know, exotic locations and maybe even sets up the occasional pop-up restaurant on the way, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, you're so right. And they're very tightly related, obviously, food and travel. And whenever you read a lot of travel stories, uh, there's always lots of food involved. And I think that's part of what makes it so interesting to me is that I obviously love the food photography, but I do a lot of location type of work. And I like the whole lifestyle. I like people. And I like to kind of tie everything together in more of a, like a series, which is also something that I wanted to talk about and in a sense of really putting photos together that go well together and, and kind of telling this little story that people can kind of look at different things and it all is kind of related but kind of not and it just it works really beautifully. And I think that doing that and, and cooking, I do a lot of things obviously, but I think that it's all kind of combined. And I get this question a lot where it's like, well, are you going to be a cook in a restaurant or do you want to have a food cooking show or are you going to be a photographer? And people want to put me in a box, right? Because everybody wants a very specific answer, right? And unfortunately, it's just not that easy. And I used to beat myself up a lot, and I still do sometimes, about making a decision. And, and you know, you have these like mini crises where you're like, where am I going? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. This isn't where I wanted to be. And I have those, you know, I still have those little breakdowns all the time. Like, what am I, where am I supposed to be? And you just have to accept that there, there's probably not one specific place that you're supposed to be in one specific thing that you're supposed to be doing and that if you continue to do what you love in one way, shape, or form, it's going to work out and it's going to make sense eventually. 
and you don't know that it's going to make sense, but it's going to. And just even going on MasterChef, being there and cooking and, you know, it's just, it was so stressful but so um, fun and, and new and totally different. And if you would have asked me three years ago on a blog where I saw myself in three years and what my goal was, it probably would have been 115% different. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. there's no doubt in my mind. My yeah. Mind. You know, I constantly ask myself what I'm going to do when I grow up. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, actually, other people ask me that. You know, what are you going to do when you grow up? Well, I don't know yet. <laughs> I haven't yeah, figured exactly. that part out. It's uh, yeah. you know, whatever, w whatever happens. And uh, you know, I recently recorded a, a, a great interview with uh, AJ Leon from uh, the Pursuit of Everything blog. Mm -hmm. And if any, if anyone listening to this hasn't had a chance to to listen to that, then um, it, there's some interesting things in there about how he. he threw himself off the rails essentially to pursue uh, a life that he felt had more meaning to him that other people thought he was totally crazy of course but anyway uh, yeah. so I understand what you what you're saying I mean things you know we, we can by by setting some of these concrete goals or putting ourselves into a box like that we can unintentionally limit what we achieve you know two three five years down the road. Oh, yeah. uh, because we, we we build these little constraints around ourselves, and so you know, I would advise anybody to, you know, just do the best you can to be the best you can be at what you do. And if if you find that you're being pulled in a in a certain direction, then then take it as long as it's you know ethical and all that kind of thing. Right, exactly. So, what, you, what you want to be doing, or what you think you want to be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, shall we uh, shall we change things up a little bit, and uh, we can switch over to your screen, and uh, you can take us on a little journey through some of your work, and we can uh, talk about some of the technical aspects of it, I guess, and uh, get into that kind of thing. Yeah, sure, absolutely. All righty. So let me see if I can switch this over. So. I'm going to make you a presenter, so you'll just get a little message on your screen that says, you know, share your screen, and, uh... and I'll say no. <laughs> That's right. We can just look at this. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> show my screen. Okay, we'll go yes. Yeah, cooking. Yeah, it's there we go. Is definitely. Awesome. Um, Food for me is definitely a, the primary part of my life, and I think that so many times it's like, you know, I have days that I'm like, well, do I really want to be cooking? Like, is that even feasible? Do I just want to you know, be shooting? But I think that being able to do both is, is huge, and, and it's always creative. I'm just a, I'm a very, well, first of all, I'm very ADD, so I'm, I get bored very easily, and I have to be busy doing things all the time. Otherwise, I'm probably lazy, <laughs> so if I can be kind of trying to do more than one thing at once, it's, it's better. You know, you know, I think it's it's funny you you say that because so many of the photographers that I talk to in my coaching programs say the same thing. You know, ADHD and being being ADD is something that seems to be a common thread, or certainly more common than uh, than I would have imagined. You know, and and it seems to affect a lot of photographers, a lot of visual. Um, visually creative people seem to seem to have that, and uh, you know, and of course, the, uh, sort of ever more frenetic uh, pace of, of life uh, means that we're just it, it, everyone's attention span is just shrinking. Eventually, goldfish will have more attention than we do, and um, and and Michael, hey Michael, I'll give you a quick shout out. Michael is in LA too. He's a a commercial photographer and a very good friend of mine, and he's, he always supports me and comes on these webinars. So thanks, Michael, for being here. He says it's better than being suicidal or a drunk. Well, I definitely uh, agree with that. <laughs> and there's a lot of those in LA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh goodness me. Um, sorry, I'm trying to open my frames here. My my computer is just moving super slow now. All of a sudden. Um, kind of possibly lagging. because it's uh, yeah you've got. The screen sharing going on. Uh, usually, if yeah. you if you maximise the window so that it takes up the whole screen, then it it's sometimes a little bit easier. But that's okay. It, we can follow along. Um, 
Sorry, it's not. It's not even reacting to me right now. Almost. I can try to open an image as soon as I get access back. That's okay. That's fine. So, I, I, and I see that that uh, that one in the background there with of the lobster sort of poking through, and that that's the one that I guess is 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 that the actual uh, set that you had that was on the cover. No, that's well, yes and no. That's not the final shot. That was one of the earlier, the bigger, like the first ones. So mm -hmm. I was going to show you, like the before and after. But I think I'm just going to try to go ahead and open some of these images if I can. Uh, I mean, if it decides that it's not going to cooperate, <laughs> which you know technology does that to us occasionally, we can just go to your website and we can talk about some of the images on the website if if need be. So, well, you know, this is. Uh, this is, you know, one of those things. Technology sometimes just doesn't, just doesn't want to play. Right. But well, at least. What uh, if I pause my screen share? If I pause my screen and then pull up a couple of images and then turn it back on, do you think? Yeah, that that will that will work. Yeah. Okay. Do you mind? No, you of course really not. Quick? Yeah, no. You All go right. right ahead. Just just uh, just hit that pause button, and it will just freeze wherever we're at, and we can just keep on talking. Um, Okay. So, uh, I guess one of, one of my questions that I have here is, uh, what's um, what would be your most and least favorite type of food to photograph? Uh, least favorite is anything brown. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's never a good situation. It's, really, it's more difficult. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's like. Soups and things sometimes can be tricky because they're like if you have anything that's kind of like homey rustic dishes that type of thing it's it's um, a lot of times they're just not as pretty so it's kind of hard to you know make it look awesome but like right. things to photograph anything that's really beautiful anything that's uh, like um, lots of negative space on the plate those types of things are always great. Oh, did I lose you? No, no, I'm still here. I just had my oh, microphone okay. on mute. I, I, I tend to mute my microphone when, I, when I'm not speaking, and, it, and occasionally uh, I, I just forget. <laughs> I forget to unmute myself. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. I, my computer is just super slow right now. I don't know what the heck happened. I'm okay. The, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Um, if it's, if it's, um, if it's going to give you some, some troubles, why don't we... Um, why don't we switch just to your website and then we can go through some of the photos on there and uh, I'm sure that some of the technical questions will be just the same as you know for pretty much for anything right okay. well, I'm gonna all right I'm gonna continue to try to make this work though okay all right you go right ahead and uh, and so um when it when it comes to a session, you know, for setting up a shoot, you know, for a client, what part of the process do you kind of stress over the most? Which which, you know, because I I mean, for example, when I was doing weddings, I mean, I I just worry myself sick about the responsibility of doing a wedding and the fact that you know I would hate to just screw up and wreck someone's day. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I mean, are, are there any parts of this process that that kind of uh, get you like that, you know, make you feel a little bit sort of worrisome? Oh, so of course. I mean, I think every, before almost every shoot, I always get a little bit nervous. I think that it's a good thing, you know. Get, having a little bit of nervousness means that it's important to you. You know, if you're nervous mm -hmm. and you're concerned, it means that it's, you want to do your best. You don't want to mess up, and that's, that's a good thing. But pre-production is always a little bit tricky. I'm always, I have this irrational fear, even when I'm, like, driving to set oh my god, please say I didn't forget my light meters. Please say I didn't forget uh, like CF cards. I'm always petrified I'm going to forget like something really small that <laughs> would absolutely destroy your shoot. You know, like I'm going to have to stop at the photo store on the way and like pick up something. So I do try to always do like a double check before I walk out my house to make sure that I have everything in my case that I need. Um, so I'm always a little bit worried about that. And then you're always just nervous that, you know, you're not going to be on, you know, like you're not going to have that vision, you're not going to connect with the subject, you're not going to connect with the client, whatever it is, and you really have to kind of have that, and I think for me personally before every shoot I really do just try to 
kind of hang out and like chat with whoever it is that I'm working with, you know, kind of get an idea of like, what they like, their style, what they're looking for. It's always very important to have a clear idea of kind of what the game plan is. And then from there, you can kind of be more creative and then you can build. And a lot of times, whenever I'm shooting, you know, things morph all the time. You never know what's going to happen that's going to change the direction of the photo shoot. So, mm -hmm. um, what's a good example? Uh, well, okay, here's an example. So I did a shoot for Edible West Side, and it was, um, the subject was going to be for a, a story about Josh and Zoe Loeb, and they are two owners. They own several restaurants here in L.A., Rustic Canyon, and uh, Milo and Olive, Sweet Rose Creamery, awesome stuff. And I was really nervous going to their homes for a couple of reasons. First of all, I knew who they were, and I had a great deal of respect for them as cooks because they're just they're amazing chefs. They have an empire. And then I was also nervous because I knew that since they were well known in the city, like I wanted to make sure that I represented them well, that I was able to kind of connect with them, and that the photos turned out beautifully. But it was very much a story about their life at home and like how they have developed this love of food that's manifested through their love for one another and their little their little boy um, Milo so getting there I was like okay I'm gonna have to be able to connect with these people emotionally a little bit because to show love and compassion for food and for people people are you know notoriously uncomfortable on camera which makes perfect sense it's not something you can just warm up to immediately mm -hmm. so that was a big struggle I was like I'm gonna have to really let them open up to me and to be themselves around me without kind of being too obtrusive. And so I think that going there, I was nervous about that. And then throughout the shoot, you know, they kind of loosened up and softened and I was able to connect with them. But you, it's just something that you have to learn for yourself and there's not a way to teach that. When I was in school, I used to hate, hate, hate the assignments where I would have to get models because I always hated like approaching people you know, I never wanted to ask someone if I could take their picture. It seems like such a strange, freaky thing, and I'm so awkward anyway that I was like, oh, I don't want to have to do this. So after a while, you kind of get used to it, and I just joke. I just completely, I just joke with people and just um, don't let myself get the better of myself. Mm -hmm. And that's really all you can do is just kind of relax and just trust that eventually things are going to work out. So the most nervous part for me is before I start shooting and just hoping that, you know, magically all of my skills don't disappear and that if you're presented with an issue, you can't solve it mm -hmm. because you're always going to be presented with an issue. Every <laughs> right. photo shoot, there's going to be something. <laughs> yep. There's always going to be some snafu and mm -hmm. you have to be able to get out of it. And a lot of that is just being a MacGyver. And as much as gear as import is important in photography, what's more important, I think that your biggest tool is just your eyes and being able to look at a situation or a composition and just somehow make it better. I mean, I've mm -hmm. used lampshades as reflectors before. I've used uh, like boxes, crates, tables, all sorts of crazy things to hold things up, candles. You can use so many different kind of obscure things. It's just you got to be able to MacGyver it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So did you get any progress on, on your screen? Did you manage to open up some photos or is it still stuck? Um, yes and no. It's kind of stuck. I'm trying to open some stuff in Photoshop right now. It's, it's okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Why, why don't we um, why don't we switch back I'm and sorry, we'll just sorry. no. That's okay. Don't worry. You know, it uh, it happens. Trust me. I mean, and uh, you know. right now we're having a snafu right now. Exactly. You know. I mean, you know, when I first started doing these, I was terrified that something was going to go wrong and I'd look like a complete and total giraffe. You know, and I was. I, <laughs> and then after the first one or two, I thought, well, you know, this is not CNN. You know, I'm not Wolf Blitzer or Nancy Grace or any of those where after everything has to be perfect, things go wrong. You know, people understand. You know, so <laughs> that's just just the way it is. So let me uh, let me switch back to um, let me switch back to me, and um, okay, all right. So so we, we should be back on on your screen I'm, I'm sorry on your website oh okay now gonna just make sure that the audio doesn't get too messed up it, it does sometimes okay and I need to move the questions box back over to where it was okay so does anybody have any like specific questions about like specific images because I could pull those up I was going to show you how I did the 
the French toast shot with the syrup, because that's actually two photographs. Oh, okay. Yeah, show you too, like the difference between um, like shooting with natural light and shooting with electronic light, or um, because a lot of times, you, you know, I'll use strobes, but then uh, you know, the majority of the time, I actually don't use strobes. I'll use um, natural light with a couple of reflectors. It's kind of one of my things that I like to do. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got some questions here. Uh, let's see. Ju uh, Julie says, uh, "Do you always shoot on location?" Um, no, I do not always shoot on location. I do a lot, but not not too much. Um, it depends. I think that for uh, you know, if someone for something like the uh, the lifestyle shoot with uh, the chefs and the and the kid, that was obviously on location because that was something where we were showing, uh, you know, their environment and all those types of things. But for a lot of the stuff from my blog, I shoot all that at home. Um, and I've shot in my living room, I've shot in my kitchen, I've shot kind of anywhere. So you can kind of do, you can do it anywhere, I think. But, um, you know, if you can just find space and kind of move around, it's just what the, what the client wants, I guess. Right, right. And, uh, and actually a thought just uh, just struck me. Um, I know you said you had some specific images that you wanted to uh, to talk about, and mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can't actually have, bring them up here on the screen. But you know, I, no, I, I am. Um, working now. I think oh, it, it is? slows it down a lot. Yeah, whenever I'm screen sharing, it slows it down a whole lot. But uh -huh. yeah, it, it it does the same to me too. Um, okay. But uh, but what we could do is because I'm recording the webinar, and and it, I'll be putting the video up on the website. Uh, probably in the next day or so. Um, if you wanted to, uh, you could send me uh, some of those images and maybe just you know a little paragraph or, or something about each one, and I'll uh, and I'll make a little slide deck or something and add it to the post uh, so that people can you know get some idea of what you were trying to uh, get across there. Does that make sense? Is that yeah, is that doable? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, Barbara had a question, and uh, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to move on to the next, uh, the next one. Oh, that's cool. Nice, uh, nice vegetables. Awesome. Okay. And uh, so Barbara, Barbara's question was, do you have a preferred aperture for food? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I do. I, always, I like shooting more wide open than anything else. You'll see in a lot of my stuff that it's pretty shallow depth of field and you know that's for a multitude of reasons but it's mostly aesthetic I think that if you can kind of focus on a you know a shallower depth of field and like one plane it, you slowly have the fall off and it's just visually more impactful you get to f really draw focus to a specific area too and that also goes back to my whole idea of less is more and kind of keeping things simple if you can indirectly direct people's eye to a specific area that's that's a good thing you know and then it's it's less busy it's more targeted you kind of get to manipulate a little bit how your viewers looking at the image so I like shooting a 2.8 a lot because 2.8 is pretty wide open it's it's the most wide for a lot of lenses not if you're getting into long lenses like a 200 or um, like 200 to 300 I think it's like f4 but I like the 2.8, and I also shoot a lot with a uh, 50 1.4 or 50 1.2, and those lenses are beautiful. The 1.2 mm -hmm. Canon 50 millimeter is a great lens. It's it's gorgeous, but it's a really it's a kind of tricky one. You have to. I would never go to a photo shoot with just that lens. <laughs> I would always have my 70 to, or 24 to 70 with me, which is probably the lens that I shoot with the most. It's a good. It's a good middle range, you know, it has really great glass. You can go to 2.8, but you can also get a little bit of zoom. Mm -hmm. um, but like the 1.2 is great for, in conjunction with other things, um, to get like a really, really shallow depth of field that starts to look almost more ethereal. And it's obviously great in low light, too. So if I'm shooting on location and uh, like open shade somewhere, that's the best. And open shade is my favorite place to shoot also for people mostly. Um, and I'll shoot maybe like portraits pretty wide open, maybe 2.8 um, or like f2, and then it kind of it has a great, you know, the focal plane behind it throws everything out of focus in a really beautiful way, and you get really nice highlights on people's faces that are really pleasing and, and uh, attractive, mm -hmm. <laughs> which and it goes well with the food too, actually. Yeah, and you know, this, this, this photograph right here uh, is fascinating to me because, you know, 
at, at first glance, you know, you, it, it looks you know kind of dark, I suppose you might say, but it, it actually, to me, it evokes a feeling of home, being very homey, and uh, you know, sort of, you know, you're in the kitchen. It's a it's a well, it's a day like today out here in Memphis, you know, grey and miserable and cold and wet, and you just want to make yourself a nice warming soup that's just going to make you feel awesome and and it feels very cottagey you know to use a sort of a, an english expression i suppose you know is that was that was that something that you deliberately wanted to portray in this particular photograph oh yeah definitely i think that for for the parsley i wanted um i wanted it to look a little bit vintagey and a little bit yeah, old, kind of very homemade, very rustic. Um, I'm drawn to that type of photography for my own style and for other photographers. I very much like the kind of contrasty, um, moodier feel. And so that with this one specifically, that's what I was doing. And um, the unusual crop too, you know, I'm not showing all the parsley. I'm kind of focusing on the, the tie, which is kind of strange, but it for me kind of worked and using the old cutting board that's kind of beat up and the string, it has a very natural, very homemade quality, which is what I was looking for. And with this photograph, I also kind of did that with a series with some other things. They were all also kind of lit that way with very directional but very um, minimal light, right? Mm -hmm. And they're all kind of processed and retouched to be darker, a little bit of a vignette, shallow up the field. And I would never put that next to a photograph like, I would never put that next to the photograph of the French toast, which is very bright, mm -hmm. very kind of sharp, um, punchy, because it wouldn't really make sense. And I think that that goes back also to editing. And one of, the, one of my biggest challenges also, you were asking me what I'm most nervous about when it comes to photo shoots. There's the pre-production where I'm nervous about actually shooting, and then fast forward two weeks, and then I am always get a little bit anxious about um, editing, because putting things together for portfolios it's really tricky because especially if you're not shooting everything black and white, if you don't shoot everything really bright in a studio, you have kind of different styles. You want to make sure to put those together appropriately. So a lot of times I go through phases, you know, for series. I might be in kind of like a cooler, moodier series that I'm working on. So all the photos have a little bit of like a cooler blue white balance to them. And then some might all be a little bit warmer. And you want to make sure to kind of keep those together. Because as someone's viewing your images, say they're clicking through your website, it can be jarring if you go from one really bright white thing to one really dark thing. And you want to kind of try to ease people viewing through those naturally. And I think that if you're editing also and retouching, say, like five series or five images from a series, you don't want to do uh, like a vintagey kind of uh, like blue and pink highlighted uh, edit, like a Photoshop, like a retouching thing, to one image and then leave the other one exactly how you shot it in camera and then do one black and white. Like mm -hmm. it's just too, it just, you can tell it's all been retouched and it just looks unnatural. So right. if you want to do that antique thing to one photo, do it to all of them. Yeah. Or if you want to leave them all straight from camera, then leave them all straight from camera. Yeah, very good point, you know, because I think, you know, it, it shows that you, you, you had an artistic intention from the beginning. It's not something like, oh, well, I just shot this, and then I'm just going to see what comes to mind when I edit it. it you actually had an intention from the get-go, and, and you stuck to that intention uh, throughout the creative process, which is, uh, which is great. Now, um, let's see. what uh, We've got some questions coming in here, so let's have a look. Uh, so uh, we talked a bit some of the, the lenses stuff. Obviously, you mentioned Canon, so you, you're a... You, Presumably, you shoot mainly uh, 35 millimeter, uh, you know, or yeah. digital um, equivalent, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, a couple of questions here. One was from, from Larry. He said, uh, "Modern Canons and Nikon's have various profiles you can create for shooting. So, what if any custom functions do you set in your cameras for high uh, for highlight control and that kind of thing?" You know, I actually don't, and. Um it's, the custom functions is a really phenomenal tool, it, and I've played around with it a little bit, but not as much as I kind of wish I would. I have a good friend who's a sports shooter, and we both went to school together, and we're good friends. And he and I are completely different. He's a massive gearhead. He probably has enough equipment to buy himself a new house, and he has like 15 <laughs> custom functions, 
and 30 different lenses for every different thing, and it's awesome, and he'll kind of give me, um, you know, he has his way of shooting, but for me, I don't, I don't utilize a lot of those things, unfortunately. I will use uh, back focus sometimes. I set up a custom function on my camera to shoot back focus if I'm doing something where I'm shooting, like in a kitchen, like if I'm shooting chefs actually working, or I'm like at a, a food event where I'm like photographing um, more like lifestyle, and I just do that because it's quicker. So then I can just hit the back focus with my thumb, and it'll kind of focus immediately on what I'm looking at as opposed to if I'm doing autofocus, you know, sometimes it'll focus on something a little bit off from where you want focus, or manual focus, which takes even longer. Um, especially, too, because I'm shooting a lot of times, my compositions aren't straight on. I very rarely shoot something directly in the center. Um, I'll usually focus on something and then physically shift my lens down to move the subject matter to a corner or a side, so that'll mess up your focus. But in terms of like highlight control and, and shadow control, even like aperture priority, I just I don't use any of those. I really I'll I'll meter the scene that I'm shooting, and then kind of get a general range for what the uh, for what the exposure would be, and then I kind of just work in that range. I should use more custom functions though. <laughs> I just don't know enough about it. Ooh, are you still there? Oh okay. yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm sorry, I did it again. <laughs> no, 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 quite all right. <laughs> I'm sitting here talking, and then everyone goes, "Are you still there?" And I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, no, this looks. Now uh, stand up routine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am for hire. Uh, the sort of small fee for comedy outings. <laughs> so um, let's have a look. We've got. Um, Oh, Jamie had a great question. Do you draw out your ideas before photographing them? How do you come up with your compositions? That is a good question. Um, I don't really, but you know what I do? I actually draw, I do sketches um, for cooking purposes. Like before I'm, when I'm conceptualizing a dish, I draw how I would plate it. So I think that in a way I kind of do that with my photography, but kind of in a different way. Um, I never know exactly what I'm going to, how I'm going to shoot something until I'm kind of doing it. And for instance, like um, there's kind of like a bag of tricks, I think, that everybody has in whatever type of photography this is they do, right? So for me, for food photography, I know that there's five or six different, not even that many, probably like four or five different angles that I like to shoot from that I kind of tend to gravitate towards. And one of those is overhead, like bird's eye. So I know that if I'm shooting, say, like five dishes for a restaurant or something, I can kind of utilize like a bird's eye for one or two, and then another one would be at eye level to the food, so I get low, very low, and then I kind of shoot straight on to get texture and depth on the side of the food. And then another one would be kind of cropping to the edge, where I'll crop into the plate on one side to kind of show the plate three quarters of the frame. And then another one might be just like a really extreme close-up where you get to see the details of whatever it is that you're looking at, whether it be like beans with sauce and like fresh herbs or fruit and or like whipped cream or something. So I don't necessarily draw up that stuff, but I think it's also because, as before mentioned, I'm, I have a short attention span. And that also uh, I like to kind of not have a plan when I'm going into things. I like to let it evolve naturally. And I think that whenever mm -hmm. you're working in a, in a creative space, if you have too much of a guideline that you're trying to stick to. It, it really hinders the type of work that you can come up with. And if you don't really have any boundaries, you're kind of free to, to come up with whatever you want. Now, having said that, there's usually an intention in the photo shoot. You know, there's maybe certain images that you have to get. You have to get this shot, and this is going to be the hero shot, et cetera, et cetera. So bearing that in mind, you can kind of play around. So I'll get what I think is the right shot, and if their client's there, like art director's there, and they're like, oh, that's perfect. That's what we need. Awesome. And then I'll keep shooting for another probably 45 minutes if I can. Because a lot of times what you think is great, just keep shooting. You know I mean, like, don't stop shooting something just because you, you think you wrapped the job. Or, or if it's for personal work, if you're like, well, I like that. That's good. I'm going to go, you know, eat lunch. Well, just, you know, play around. Like, then I might change out the set. So if I'm shooting ravioli and uh, I got a great shot, and then, okay, well, maybe I'll eat a few of them or I'll pull some of them off and then kind of, like, tear one in half and keep shooting. Because then you have detail shots. So then that's where you can kind of start to tell a story, too. All of a sudden, one photograph turned into a series. And now you could even make a, a blog post about that. Or, and, then, 
and then take some photographs of um, like one of the cooks if you're in a kitchen you can take some photographs of them working take a photograph of their hands like rolling them and swarming the ravioli or or some of the raw vegetables some of the raw ingredients on a cutting board or the atmosphere like take a detailed shot of if they have like an old oven or you know there's a guy that has like funny handprints on his apron who knows like it could be anything but if you kind of just keep shooting after you think you got what you needed I find some of my favorite photographs, even for just personal work, are usually ones that were outtakes or were extras that I just shot because, because they didn't tell me not to. I'll keep shooting until someone's like, okay, you know, you need to get out of the kitchen. And I'll leave. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, yeah, if you're yeah. already there, take advantage. If you're, in a, if, you're, if you're already doing something and you're already set up, just take advantage of that. Because you know, setting up and breaking down gear is such a pain in the butt. I'm like, well, I've already got it here. I might as well do something else. <laughs> so, you, so you're there until someone shows up winding the alarm clock up and yeah. going, you know, we really need to get to bed, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to finish up here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, sorry, just one more. <laughs> uh, so let, let, me, uh, let me switch to uh, another one. I do have more images up on my screen. I don't know if you want to try to do the screen share thing again. Or okay, um, we can... We can, we can certainly do that. Let's, uh, we, can, we can try that in a second. Uh, sure. uh, Barbara uh, just wanted some clarification. Uh, sure. You talked about back focus earlier on, and she said, never heard of back focus. Please explain in more detail. Okay. So back focus is um, it's just a function where there's a, a button on your camera, kind of like where your thumb would be on the right-hand side, and you can push that to immediately focus on any of your... Um, like little square focusing points on your viewfinder. So you're looking through your viewfinder and you have those little squares for where you can have focus. So you would set your focusing point to be, say, like the top left little square. And then whenever you hit that back focus button, it's going to immediately focus on that spot and nowhere else. And even if you move your camera, that's where it's going to focus every single time. So that's, it's just a way that your, you know, your focus doesn't kind of like shift in and out onto different subjects without you wanting it to. Right. That okay. Sense, yeah, I'm Sorry, sure. That, the most technical. <laughs> no, that's that, that's fine. That was a way way better explanation than I could have possibly offered uh, <laughs> on that one. So uh, it's good okay. for speed. I think that's one of the big things. Is a lot of people like it because it's quicker. So that way, you you know, you're not holding down your your um, uh, your camera button for like a second, waiting for it to focus. You just hit that back focus button and it immediately focuses whatever is in that space. In the viewfinder. Right. Okay. Uh, so, do, shall we uh, shall we be brave and, and see if we can uh, make you a presenter again and see what see if we can bring something up from your screen? I think so. Yeah. Think come so. on. Let's go for it. Let's. Yeah, uh, we'll be brave. So. All right. This is live TV, everybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's life without a bit of fun, huh? Right, no, that's for sure. I mean, I'm really enjoying this. This is this is an awesome uh, presentation, Becky. I mean, it really, it really oh. is, uh, and I think people are uh, people seem to be enjoying it too. You know, there's lots of uh, lots of people in here for sure. Hmm. Uh, oh, cool, man. Yeah, I hope so. I'm kind of just wing it. I mean, not really much of a plan. Just kind of telling you how I feel. I guess about things. Yeah. So, you know, and, and and you know, this is why I love doing this. You know, it's 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 so awesome for me to be able to see into the world of so many different talented photographers and really learn, you know, how they work. And uh, I mean, I I think you know, I, I learn as as much out of these as the, as the people that come. So I, I'm happy to sit here all day and uh, and do that. <laughs> okay, so what? Uh, what do we have here? I see some French toast with uh, some yummy-looking blackberries and blueberries and raspberries on there, which looks phenomenal. <laughs> cool. Yeah. That, so this is the dish shop, and this was for a um, for a hotel, for a website, or not site, but um, it's called Hotel Angelino, and they have a restaurant at the top of their place called West, and they want to just like some new like fresh shots for breakfast they were doing like a, a marketing thing for brunch so mm -hmm. just did some shots for them this was one of them that um, right now this is the raw photos this is what it looks like coming straight out of camera okay and just just uh, just one second uh, we, we can see your whole screen is that um, is that what you intended that 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 window 
is um, kind of taking up a little piece in the middle. Okay. Do you want me to make it bigger? Um, possibly. If you could, it'd be, it would help uh, just a little bit. Yeah, I'm, going full I'm getting old, you know. I mean, I, I can't see little things anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then it's gone. <laughs> yeah, it's going to full screen. Sorry, everything's moving at um, you know, like molasses in January over here. <laughs> Sorry, it's disappearing. I promise it's going to come back. I should have done that before. Again. That's okay. So, oh, I can really quick, though. Actually, I can tell you about... So, these two photographs at the bottom, if you can kind of see. So those were part of the same series. And you can see um, the color is a little bit, like, different. Like, there's kind of, like, some blue and magenta in the shadow as well. We're French toast. That's what's happening there. Mm -hmm. See that? Oh. Ah, there we go. Okay, so. To make it bigger. But so, yeah, so this shot was for um, some brunch stuff that they were doing. And this was... Straight out of camera. Now this is one of the that was kind of a happy accident shot where I just kind of kept shooting after. Like I I wanted to do some with syrup, but I started with the syrup because you know I didn't want to mess it up. And then I was shooting by myself here, so this is me with my camera on a tripod, kind of trying to click the shutter at the same time that I'm pouring the syrup. So. I'm also <laughs> do the majority of my own food styling, so a lot of times when I'm shooting, it's I'm also styling what it is that I'm doing, depending on the job. So uh, you have to be very agile. You have to be able to kind of multitask. Yeah, I'm right. Kind of trying to hold hold a reflector and then like you know put putting a fork on something, whatever. So anyway, so this one, um, what I did was layers wise. I'm just going to start to click my layers on here, but I like to. Uh, this is like just a um, the next layer is just a retouch layer where I've um, I actually dropped another photo on top of it. So you can see it kind of loading where mm -hmm. I had kind of shifted another photograph down slightly. Um, let's click the next layer and see what this one is. So like this was one of those phot photos where I, um, I had two with the syrup coming down. And one of them, the berries looked better but the pour was kind of off kilter. So hopefully you see that the, the syrup is in like a straight line, it's coming straight down, whereas before it was kind of coming at an angle, and it uh -huh. looked kind of um, undone, like it just wasn't really right. I added a little bit of cost. So let's see if this guy will turn on now. So to, to create contrast in a lot of my photos, what I do is, is I'll create a duplicate layer of my retouched layer. <clears throat> and then I desaturate that, so command or shift command U, I believe. And then I'll change the blend mode of that layer. Come on, buddy, to soft light. And when you change soft light, it's it's basically mathematically working in those shadows that are black and white to kind of create more depth, so mm -hmm. you're getting more contrast in the shadows. And then I mask it to mask out parts that maybe get a little too blown out or a little too dark. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll drop the saturation of that layer, the opacity rather. And then curves, I probably did a little bit of light in the shadows. It was a little bit dark. So I, I just work from the from the bottom up. With food photography in terms of retouching, there's, there's typically not a lot of retouching that you want to do, for me personally. Um, especially because a lot of times I'm... Like I mentioned, I do uh, kind of undone, you know, so it looks like it's a little bit in the midst of being eaten or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So I, I, wanna, I don't want to clean it up too much. So a lot of times it's adding a little bit of contrast or maybe desaturating it a little bit to kind of give it a little bit more of like a, a lighter feel. Um, it's really just about creating whatever kind of mood you're kind of looking for this. And I, I want it to be bright and happy and all that good stuff. Right, so it's right. Kind of a brighter image. And, and this goes back to what we were, uh, what we mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar was that you know you you work on creating the, um, how do we put it, the perfectly imperfect image. So rather yeah. than trying to have everything just so and, and all that kind of thing, uh, some degree of imperfection makes the image seem more real, right? Yeah. Absolutely, and that's that's definitely the type of 
style that I've kind of started to develop and um, focus on for myself is that creating the perfect and perfect image for me is about really showcasing what the food really is in a very real way, but still making it look appetizing, still mm -hmm. making it look like something that, like ideally, it's what your French toast would look like. You know, like in a perfect world, whenever we are idealizing the food that we like to eat, it looks a certain way. You know, if, if I were to photograph this like with my iPhone by itself, it, it wouldn't look appetizing. It would look kind of like, okay, well, that's French toast, but it's... It doesn't look like something where you're like, dang, I really want to, <laughs> yeah, right. I really want to eat that right now. And that a lot of it goes into technicality, what aperture you're using, where your light is directed, if you're doing all these things. And the other half of that is is just letting the food kind of speak for itself and focusing on each little ingredient and not showing too much. Because what an image really looks like and what an image is idealized as are two very different. So realistically, this thing would probably be covered and covered with butter and syrup. But I only choose to pick a couple that look prettier and kind of strategically place those around the frame to compositionally make it more um, interesting as opposed to shooting it as it is mm -hmm. and then uh, having too much going on. That it, it's okay, cool. Uh, we have a couple of questions about lighting. And um, uh, Edward asks, um, you know, besides natural light, what professional lighting equipment uh, do you use? And then uh, Craig was asking about strobes and you know, artificial light and that kind of thing too. So I guess we could sort of roll that topic into one. Um, yeah, I mean, do you, you mentioned natural light earlier on, but do you do you also use artificial light? Yeah, I do. I totally do. Um, so the strobe that I use, I use Prophotos. Um, well, I use Prophotos about half the time, but I also have Dyna lights that I've actually been using a lot lately because they're lighter and they're really easy to transfer and they're surprisingly durable. So I like the Dyna lights. I have, I think, like five heads and three packs. And um, I don't remember what the watt seconds are. I think like 1,200 and then a couple of 800s or something like that. Um, and they're great. And then I have like Photoflex light modifiers. So I have a couple soft boxes and um, uh, like some reflectors, a few umbrellas, those types of things. And like I said, I use Camp 5D Mark II, and then I have a grip on it, so that's for extra battery power, and that has a, you know, an additional shutter release on the grip, which is handy, especially if I'm not using a tripod. And mm -hmm. then I also have a, let's see, I use Manfrotto tripod, then I have, one of my favorite things actually is my, um, my Manfrotto, what do they call it, like a telescoping arm, and it's basically the head that goes on the top of your camp on your uh, tripod and so mm -hmm. you can shoot bird's eye directly down. So it's, it's a lateral arm that goes back and forth. You can kind of slide your camera over to one side. It's really nice if you're shooting like one set and you want to be able to kind of manipulate good too if I'm shooting tethered or if I'm shooting like to a computer like with Wi-Fi. That way mm -hmm. the camera's not moving but I can I can look from my computer or and see exactly how my frame is is framed up. That's good if I'm shooting for like the magazine covers where I mm -hmm. need to have like X number of inches of headspace for the for the verbiage at the top. I can quite literally just frame the photograph exactly how it's going to look on the magazine and inlay the you know the heading right on top so I, I get a perfect of how much space I need and all that. So those are some of my favorite things. Cool. And I, I know you sent me a list of resources of some of the equipment that you use, and I'll make sure I'll put those in the in the show notes on the blog when I when I put this out there as well, so that people can check out some of those uh, links to equ equipment and, and gear and, and that kind of thing. So that's that's great. And um, I see we're yeah, coming. Yeah, just a few things. They're they're inexpensive things too. So it's not. I didn't link out to like you know a ten thousand dollar camera setup that I would love to have. It's like a little arm with like a grip end and an A clamp that is really, really handy for holding like a, a foam core, like a, you know, a fill card or something like mm -hmm. that. So it's little tools that make a difference. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I found that some of my my favorite tools were, you know, came from Walmart, you know, little grips and things like that, you know, or from Home Depot, you know, little $2 things. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Use a lot of those. <laughs> so expensive, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's huge. <laughs> so, um, okay. And I see we're coming up on about the 90-minute mark. So, um, 
if, uh, if anyone's get, got any sort of last minute questions before we uh, before we wrap up, then I'm sure we can probably take a couple more. Um, uh, Susan was asking, do you uh, do you use macro lenses at all? Uh, you know, those specifically sort of, uh, yeah, I guess Nikon call them micro lenses and other people call them macro lenses, but uh, obviously you shoot close up, so um, I don't know, do you? I do. I don't I don't actually own any macro lenses, no. I mean, it's it's funny. Like, I know that there are, I think it's 100 millimeter. There's a 100 millimeter Canon macro that's really gorgeous that I shot with one time um, that I'd like to own, but I, I don't yet. <laughs> um, but I do shoot a lot of close-up. I never shoot super, super close-up. The tightest I'll ever get is maybe within, like, I don't know, 8 to 10 inches from the subject, which is pretty tight, but... I guess it kind of just depends on the subject matter. I, I like the style. I obviously shoot tight, but I don't specifically shoot with macro. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Peter says, do you have any tricks that you use to make the food look a certain way? Um, yeah, totally. I think that, okay, let me, let me organize my thoughts here. Tricks. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try to think of something you guys probably don't already know, which is difficult because I feel like you guys probably already know a lot about this stuff. But uh, shooting soups and things, a really common uh, trick for that is that you actually, uh, you know, you put something in the soup at the bottom, like a piece of uh, foam, and then you, like, soak that, or, like, a sponge. A lot of times you put a sponge at the bottom, and what that does is it kind of creates a little platform to put whatever is inside the soup on top of. Because if you were making uh -huh. you know, like one of the photographs, beef stew, you know, all that stuff sinks to the bottom. So like a little brunoise of carrots and like little pieces of chipolini onion and all those things aren't going to be distinguishable unless you fill the bowl up super high and put tons of stuff in there, which looks unnatural. <laughs> so you can, you put the sponge in, you put some of the ingredients on top, and you pour in some of the broth, and then you get that look like it's a full bowl of soup without it actually being a full bowl of soup. Wow, so that's, so that's, one. <laughs> that's like the old joke, wait till there's a sponge in my soup. <laughs> exactly. It's supposed, it's supposed to be there. Um, something else too, just a couple of notes too on styling and food. Um, you never actually sauce or dress things as much as you think you would in real life. Like just almost nil. So if you're make if you're doing a pasta or a salad, you really want to just very, very lightly toss some of that sauce on there and then kind of put it in your bowl, put it on set, see how it looks, and then maybe add a little bit more with it actually on set because Whenever you're dressing a plate for yourself, you're looking at it from high up, right? You're, you're, you're looking down on the dish. So you're not actually seeing it the way the camera's going to see it. So you want to do any kind of final dressings, if you will, once it's actually on set. Because then mm -hmm. you can look through the lens. You can say, okay, this spaghetti, there looks like there's like a hole here. And then you can put a couple of leaves on. Also, whenever you're storing vegetables and things like that, you kind of don't want to store them in sealed containers. You kind of want to keep everything with a little bit of air on them. It helps to keep them kind of fresh and vibrant with herbs. You know, you can kind of wash them if you want and then put them on towels and let them dry that way. Right. And if you're using strobes, don't, uh, don't leave them using hot lights. I don't think anybody really uses hot lights when you're shooting video. But definitely don't leave food anywhere in hot light for any more than like 10 seconds because it will die instantly. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. yeah, and have your set set up, you know, have your composition, have everything kind of ready to go before you pull the food on set. Unless you're doing, like I said, um, like the aisle thing where there's people that are actively working with the food while you're shooting, in which case, you know, all that styling stuff kind of goes up in a bit. Cool. And, and do, I mean, do you have anything uh, in your tube – toolbox specifically to make the food look uh, look yummy and fresh? This was a question from uh, JV. So, uh, any no, that's a great question. Yeah, kind of. I have a lot of little spray bottles. And, um, I like wooden skewers a lot, those long, like super cheap wooden skewers that you would get to if you were making like um, toffee or something. Uh, those are great for actually just kind of moving things around within the food. So if you have to kind of uh, prop something up, for instance, I'll use like a little piece of cardboard or like a little piece of cord that I'll kind of fold over, and I'll use that to prop up whatever the food is, and then I'll kind of use a wooden board to fold over and kind of maneuver things. Um, little paint brushes are great. The little wooden paint brushes you can just get them at like Home Depot or 
or an art store. And those are good for both cleaning off a plate and also like applying a little bit of water or oil. And um, I just keep a little bottle of oil on hand. And you can mix that with equal parts of water. And you can put that in a spray bottle and you can spray that on the outside of like a glass or something to make it look like it's setting, which is always kind of handy. Um, the more classic way to do that would be to first spray it with dulling spray or hairspray and then spritz half water, half oil on it, and that'll give you beading. So it looks like whatever that that container or device is, is like sweating like, ah, okay. like a cold glass of iced tea or a, or a beer or something, which is kind of handy. And um, yeah, so that's, that's some of the stuff. I also like to... I don't know, just have a, what the ingredients are in the dish, just have extra. So you can kind of maybe sprinkle them around, or like if you're shooting a sandwich, have a little bit of kind of like rub between hands to get some crumbs that kind of will look more natural, like they just place it down. Right. And it, it's not as um, uh, staged, I guess, if you will. And lots of lemons. I have tons of different <laughs> kinds of like lemons and napkins and pretty proppy things. Cool. And even though you think it's not going to be needed, if you kind of fold up a, a napkin and put it way back in the background, you get a little pop of, of unfocused color, which kind of makes the image more interesting. Right. So, I mean, you, you can never be... like frozen on this. Right? Oh, that's okay. Don't, don't worry. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a case of just being, being prepared whenever you go out. So, um, yeah. I guess, yeah. you know, as we, as we get to finish up here, um, you know, when you were... Uh, when you when you went through that sort of that marathon uh, filming time with the the Master Chef show and stuff, I mean, did were you ever uh, tempted or called upon to to photograph the food that you all were making there? <laughs> I wish no, <laughs> I wanted to. It's so funny. I you know, I totally want to. And, um, a lot of the dishes, actually, like if you go, you can pick up the MasterChef cookbook that's actually out for sale now, and I have a bunch of recipes in there. And they, the recipes that they chose, they chose, I think, maybe half of those to then photograph for the cookbook, obviously. And they did it all in New York, and I was, I remember joking with one of the EPs that I was like, hey, I, you know, if you need a photographer for that, you know, I happen to know one. <laughs> You're in. So I wanted to shoot it, but no. Well, they all, dang it. So of course I'm I'm looking through the cookbook with like a very scrutinizing eye. Mm -hmm. No, it was it was good. They were they turned out really well. Wow, well, and I, you know I I know that that was an incredible uh, experience for you. And I think you know when we when we were sort of sitting at home just watching the show week after week. Of course, by the time we got to see it, I, I guess you were probably done filming by the time we got to see. Yeah the end of it, uh, you know, because I know you said you were filming for like two months straight or something, which is a quite a yeah. punishing schedule. But um, <laughs> it was intense. It was intense. <laughs> uh, yeah, we filmed for two months, and then they went to editing, obviously, and then I think they edited it in like three months, which is really quick. I mean, for a show of that production value, for them to get all those episodes cut with a couple of months is phenomenal, actually. So. Yeah, during filming, we had no contact with anyone, so no phone, no internet, no nothing. We were like living like cave women people. <laughs> just had to eat, sleep, and think about cooking every day. Oh my yeah, gosh! So. It, <laughs> well, it was equal parts. Uh, it was equal parts. I think like fun and kind of invigorating, and then equal parts stressful and irritating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly enjoyed it anyway. And, uh, well, with that, I, I, I would like to uh, say a huge, huge thank you, uh, Becky, for doing this with us today. It has been really awesome. I, I've had a great time. Uh, I know we've had a couple of technical challenges with, uh, with the screen and so on, but you've been so generous uh, with your time and uh, sharing your knowledge and experience with the rest of us. And uh, I've got just lots and lots of people saying thank you, thank you, thank you, coming in in the, in the questions. So thank you, everybody, uh, for that. And, oh, yeah, and that's awesome. Yeah, so, I, you know. It's, it's my pleasure, really. 
Well, it's been great. It really has. And, uh, and so, and of course, thank you to everyone that, that showed up as well this afternoon. You know, we wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for you guys actually turning up and, and listening. I suppose we could just come and just do this by ourselves, but it wouldn't be half as much fun, uh, of course. So thank you, everybody, for being yeah. here. And, and thanks again, Becky. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. And now I'm having sat here and, looked at all these amazing photographs of uh, fantastic food. I'm really kind of hungry now, so I'm probably going to go get my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it won't look anything like as good as that. I'm going to have to see if you do mail order food or something like that. It brings them over to me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future. Maybe someday. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when well, you thanks, open... Uh, it was my pleasure. It was cool talking. Oh, it was awesome. And, you know, but oh, when no, you no, open no. your restaurant, when, when, you, when you get your restaurant, and I, as, as I know you will... Uh, I definitely want to come and, uh, and and sample that for sure. Oh man, you've got a you have an open table. I will, <laughs> I will gladly serve you and anybody else for that matter. Of course. <laughs> um, All right. Well, listen. You fun. you take care. It's been great having you here, and uh, to everyone uh, that came, thank you for coming. And as always, I wish you continued peace in your business, and uh, look for the recording on the blog. Definitely. Thank you so much. And feel free for anybody to like tweet me or find me on Facebook or my blog or my website. And I'll answer any other questions you have. Oh, sure thing. Know. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll make sure that we put your contact information in the blog post so that people can uh, uh, get a hold of you and, <laughs> and that kind of thing too. All right. Well, oh, for sure. you take care and uh, we'll be t I'll be talking to you again soon. I bet. Thanks, Nigel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.